In looking out into space, we are also travelling in time. We can look at objects so far away that we see them not as they are now, but as they used to be when the universe was young. And that's what we are going to do in the next hour. Look back over nearly half a century of the sky at night. A journey through space and time. Welcome to a look back at the sky at night. You know, when I began the programs way back in April 1957, I had no idea I'd still be making them every four weeks, half a century later, but that's what happened, and that really is a world record. Good evening. Well, I'm afraid Burnham's Comet turned out to be something of a disappointment. Good evening. Well, as you've all heard by now, there's been another unsuccessful American moonshot. Good evening. We've just had some amazing photographs sent back by the American probe to Mars, Mariner 6. Well, as you can see, we're doing this program from my home in Selsey, but I've got an old thatched house within sound of the sea. Hello to the first ever Sky at Night from Stonehenge. This month's Sky at Night is about the distances of the stars. Good evening. Last month was one of the most exciting in the whole story of space research. We've really exciting news. Halley's Comet has been sighted for the first time in over 70 years. For once, I'm not in the studio or even on the ground. I am, in fact, in an aircraft flying over the Canary Isles. Since 1957, we've covered every aspect of astronomy, and things have certainly changed. In those far-off days, we believed in oceans on Venus and vegetation tracts on Mars, and how wrong we were. One thing we tried to do all the way through is to interest people and urge them to go outside and look up. Look at things like the Pleiades. I wonder if you've noticed these stars arranged in a group. They're in the southern part of the sky at the moment, rather high up, and they're quite easy to identify. And they make up the star cluster which we call the Seven Sisters or the Pleiades. So let's find out how many stars can be seen in the main cluster of the Pleiades without using a telescope or any instrument uh, apart from ordinary spectacles if you happen to wear them? The answer, surprise, surprise, was seven. Over the years, we've done a number of outside broadcasts, but of course, we are always completely at the mercy of the weather. But at the present moment, unfortunately, we run into one of these banks of cloud. What we plan to do is to start off by showing you some stars, and then go on to the moon, then Jupiter, and finally the most spectacular thing of all, Saturn, the planet with the rings, which never has been shown before on direct television. I can't no. see a single star at the moment. It's totally obscured. George, I'm going to break in, I'm sorry, but I just got a message through from Edinburgh that they've got a picture of Jupiter. So let's go now over to Edinburgh. Yes, there is Jupiter as seen through the big telescope at the Royal Observatory, Edinburgh. That is now a direct picture from the sky. It's not a drawing or a photograph or a recording or anything else. You are seeing Jupiter as it really is at this moment. Well, I'm glad we saw that anyhow. I am too. To the try moon and get is just being awkward. The moon is just being awkward at the moment, I'm afraid. No telescope yet built will show a star. It's is gone, anything except point of light? Is it gone? Oh, no. Just as I got it on the crosswires, it blacked right out. How absolutely typical. There's nothing we can do about it. I can't move a 24-inch telescope quicker than that. No, I'm afraid you can't. At least we had really good luck with our star party in Selsey last year. If you follow the belt down, you come to Sirius over there. In Canis Major. In Canis Sirius, Major. So then, so minor in just Major. Above. And then of course, go the other way. Go the opposite way, you then get Taurus, you get Aldebaran, and of course you get the wonderful little cluster of the Pleiades, which we can just That's see right. about five or six stars. In the garden, there are my three main telescopes. And I wonder how many hours I've spent in using them. Well, I'm afraid I haven't got any space rockets in my garden, but I have got a couple of big telescopes, and the largest of them is a 12 and a half inch reflector in this runoff shed. Shed's very easy to operate. It has the great advantage you can get your telescope working quickly.
This is what we call an altazimuth mounting, and you can see you can swing it round anywhere, and it is very convenient from that point of view. But it hasn't actually got the drive on it, and so most of my planetary observing is done with the other telescope, which has got the equatorial mount and is in a dome a few yards away. Well, this is a perfectly conventional telescope with an eight and a half inch mirror, and it's on a massive equatorial mount, as you can see, so it's very suitable indeed for observing the planets. This is my new one. I can't resist showing it to you. This is my 15 and a half inch reflector, and you can see it's pretty massive. Wooden tube. I rather like that. Some people don't. A really massive fork mounting, and it's got to be heavy, because don't forget, when you're using a high magnification, you've got to keep your telescope absolutely steady. I hope it's fair to say that the sky at night has encountered quite a number of would-be young astronomers. For example, this lad, Timothy. Well, he's grown up now, and here is Sir Timothy Rice in the garden with a great friend of mine, Dr. Brian May. This telescope is one year older than I am, 1946, and it's a 12 and a half inch, quite a famous instrument, really, used by Patrick to do his map of the, the moon, which was the first at the time. And that was what really established him as a worldwide famous astronomer, wasn't yes, it? Yes, of course, no photographs at all. He's just sitting there with his pencil and paper yeah. drawing it, the entire map of the moon, which is still very useful. He's a, he's a great scientist and great astronomer. He really is. He always calls himself an amateur, but of course, really, he's an honorary professional. What was your first memory of the sky at night? In, back in 1957, it started, didn't it? 57, when I was 10 years old, and um, it was on very late, so I wasn't really allowed to stay up to, to watch telly at that time. Um, but I got special dispensation for the sky at night, and we all watched it, the family watched it every week. Um, and it was just an amazing mystery opened up to me. I absolutely wanted to be an astronomer from that time onwards. I got one of Patrick Moore's books out of the school library and then had to buy it because I couldn't let go of it. Um, called The Earth, which I still have, you know, telling you all about you know, the, the evolution of the Earth up to the point of trilobites and stuff. Never forgot that. And it, it kindled my enthusiasm forever. I got interested in astronomy through a book uh, that my father left lying around the house in, I guess, 1950-51, when I was only about six. And then suddenly I was aware that there was this program on every month, you know, without fail. And then I realized that Patrick Moore wrote books and, and gradually it all expanded from there. Well, this was the book that Brown talked about and published in the 1950s. When he and Tim came in from the garden, we talked about comets and eclipses. I have a house in Cornwall, slap in the middle of the point of, to of totality, and I was very excited for years, looking forward to 1999, August. And mm. it was so disappointing because the actual mm. eclipse was cloud-covered. But there was a moment in the clouds where certainly I saw, for about 10 seconds, the clouds almost went away, and they went away enough, and I know you shouldn't do this normally, but with the naked eye you could see the moon three-quarters in front of the sun. The sky is totally overcast, only a slight brightening where the sun we know is. And, well, I fear we've got to wait. My we're still well over an hour from Saturday, and I haven't given up hope yet. There's a break. Look there, there's a break in the cloud, and there is the crescent sun. We're about 15 minutes from Saturday, and we've just had our first glimpse of the eclipse. And the cloud is there, it's drifting, and there may be hope yet. Look, you see there the crescent sun, and not very long to go now. Oh, clouds, keep away, please. Totality, and the light fades, and down here, we can't see it. From the aircraft, of course, we can, but from this ground, I fear we are going to miss totality. There's cloud up there, but you can see the light level going down, the temperature dropped, kind of eerie half-life, not like an ordinary dawn or dusk at all. But I very much fear, from here we won't see the corona, but of course, from the aircraft, we can, and the last sliver of the sun vanishes, and then there's totality, the diamond ring, and there the lovely corona, a maximum-type corona, Beautifully symmetrical, and that is the sight of a lifetime. From down here, sadly, we are still under total cloud, and we're missing it. The sky has gone dark, and the entire landscape is altered now. And that is totality, lasting for two precious minutes. And down here, all we can see, I fear, is gloom. A few scattered breaks on the cloud, but unfortunately, nowhere near us. I remember at school we had a... Um, because I was at school in Sussex, actually, and, and ours was the only house that had television. We had one really ancient black and white telly in a room known as the Dive. And I can remember 
I remember you broadcasting f from somewhere in Yugoslavia. Yes, yeah, it was 1961. Yes, 61. Well, it's mm -hmm. interesting because thank goodness I got that right because that was my last but one year at school. I remember all of us crowding in and people illegally from other houses fighting in this small dive just to see your program from Yugoslavia. There's the sun, the actual crescent, which I didn't think we'd see a few minutes ago. The clouds of the, clouds and the mist will roll away just at the right moment, but the great moment is coming up. And the main thing about a total eclipse, you know, is the suddenness with which, with which it all happens. But that must have been very early days of Eurovision. I mean, not the song contest, but of the ability to do live programs from Yugoslavia. It was the first time it had been done. We showed the eclipse three times, from France, Italy, and Yugoslavia. The first time it had ever been done. That was a, was a, pion was a pioneering work. Hello from Yugoslavia. This is Patrick Moore talking to you from what must be one of the most desolate spots in Europe. And we are having a most exciting time here. We are in a cloud at the moment, right on the top of this mountain, but we can see the sun. We're now in this wonderful French observatory in South France, and there's one of the television cameras mounted on a telescope in a dome, and I'm actually in a small room attached to that dome. This is Trinity Bridge over the river, which runs through the center of Florence, where at the moment there's a terrific sense of expectancy. The sun is over three quarters eclipsed, and there's a weird kind of light. Patrick, one of the greatest memories I will have forever is, uh, is the transit party of Venus at your house. Yes, that was a great program, I think. Now we know the transit is about to start. Yeah, I've got it in H Alpha. It's there. It's right on the very limb. I can see it just cutting through the, the top of the photosphere. I can see it just coming in on the edge of the disc now. There's a very small bite. There it out is. Of it. There's the inner star. Just first contact, a tiny notch. So, Damien, it's really clear now on the, the projection. We can see Venus is half onto the disk. What's the computer showing you? Yes, it's showing uh, Venus about halfway onto the solar disk now. Uh, yes, it's looking very clear. Um, about four or five minutes' time, we should see the uh, black drop. I can see it quite clearly, and there's no mistaking it now. And uh, even after 47 years of the sky night, something we've never seen before, and like nothing we've seen before. And we won't see again from here, after all. This really is a one-off, and I'm so glad we have these perfect conditions. Exactly. It's nice to have a blue sky for something. It else. really oh, is. Cool. Tell us about this telescope. It's, am I allowed to call it the low-tech way of looking <laughs> at things? You can if you like. Yes, it won't <laughs> mind. This is my childhood instrument, really. It's, it's a Newton, Newtonian um, reflector, which me and my dad made out of a kit, you know, and it uh, cost almost nothing. But it does work, as you can see. It's and, a beautifully uh, sharp image, actually. I like, I like the coat hanger attachment. I, think that's I was very pleased with that. That was a last-minute modification. I think it was invented by Mrs. Heath and Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> there, is that the black drop yes, there? Yes, that's it. You can see it there. Yes, that's the black drop. We were lucky down here because we have a whole collection of amateur astronomers and professionals too, and we had perfect weather. The entire thing was visible from my observatory. Amazing. And then as soon as the transit finished, the sky clouded over. So we had a perfect day, really. <laughs> Two great musicians who are also astronomers. Well, I've never had a music lesson, but I do care a great deal about music. And at the start of the sky at night, I had to choose opening music. What should it be? Intermezzo and Corabia Street by Sibelius, Grieg's Homage March, or the one we finally did choose, an old 78 recording of At the Castle Gate from Pelius and Melisande, again by Sibelius. And I think that was a good choice. But after all, in a way, music and astronomy do go together. William Herschel, discoverer of the planet Uranus, was a professional organist. And on one occasion, um, I did nerf myself and play a piece of Herschel's music on the piano, live. <laughs> I wonder when that was last played. About 1800, I should think.
though, gentlemen. Yes? There is one place which you can see not only Mars and Venus, but all the other heavenly bodies. Oh, where is that, may I ask? I'm delighted you asked me that, because I'm going to show you. <laughs> Morecambe and Wise, who were, who were great to work with, believe me. Well, the Skylab began in April 1957. The Space Age began later that year, and in 1961, up went the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. The first man in space, the first spaceman in history. You know, if I'd come on the air in 1957, when we did the first of these Sky at Night programmes, and said that within five years, I'd be showing you pictures of the first man to go round the Earth in orbit in a spaceship, well, I think you'd have regarded me as mad. It was also the Russians who took the lead in sending rockets to the moon. And they sent their probe, Luna 3, round the moon and got back the first pictures of the far side we never see from Earth. They had used some of my maps, and they very kindly sent me that globe. See where I go now. Well, this time, also, we were sending rockets to the other planets, and two very regular and welcome visitors to the sky at night were Dr. John Zarnecki and Professor Gary Hunt. And talking about the moon, I turned to John Zarnecki. I can remember back in the 1950s when I was a, a, a child growing up, there was tremendous mystique, for example, about the far side of the moon. We'd never seen the far side. In September 1939, the Russians landed their Lunik 2 on the moon's surface, not far away from the great 50-mile crater, which we call Archimedes. And then, in October 1959, just a bit less than a year ago, came that great triumph with the Russian rocket Lunik 3, which actually went round the moon and photographed that part of the moon's surface which we can never see from the Earth because it's always turned away from us. Well, I for one certainly won't forget those pictures because they came through on the night we began to do one of these Sky at Night programs and we were the first to give these pictures uh, in this country. And that actually was a picture taken in the studio uh, in October 1959 when I was reading out the announcement. These pictures of the other side of the moon were quite staggering. They were much better than we dared to hope. And this is the first one that came through. Do you remember that one, Gary? Indeed, I think our pulse obviously quickened when it was suddenly decided we will go to the moon, the famous statement, and then the whole build-up to, to the missions to the moon, and a chance to sit down and plan very much what we, we expected to find there. And that's where, of course, your own observations came very much part of it. I think it'll be wise for the first explorers to come down well away from the moon's equator. And my guess for what it's worth is that the first landing is liable to take place in this large, dark plain, which we call the Sea of Showers. I remember, of course, at that stage, there was a theory, not widely supported by people like me, that the entire moon's surface was covered with deep dust drift. We, if we wanted to know exactly what the surface uh, materials were, we could analyse them by throwing out a sticky tape from the rocket and drawing the tape back so that uh, possibly bits of, the, bits of the rock, bits of the dust would stick to it and uh, we could analyse these inside the rocket and send the results back. Well, thank you very much, Dr Fielder, and I'm quite sure you're right when you say that these experiments are going to be interesting, and I think they're going to be made pretty soon. I think you'll agree with that, too, because all the indications are that the Russians are now making such immense progress that almost anything may happen at any moment. Well, this is a scale model of the lunar cob that's now standing on the surface of the moon, and I think this probably represents the greatest Russian triumph yet. And in this model they brought over to the Paris, Paris exhibition, uh, there are all kinds of interesting features that can be seen. First of all, look at those wheels. There are eight wheels altogether that make the thing move, and each one has its own independent set of motors, so that if one happens to fail, the remaining seven will carry on. These showed us that uh, there was a regolith, you know, there is a surface layer of, of, of dust, but it's, it's not uh, too thick. And of course it's generated by impacts, impacts over the age of, of, of the moon, and of course it's impacts that, uh, that generate the craters that we see. It certainly is. Remember the tremendous argument about that, whether volcanic or whether the impact? I was on the wrong side. How did the moon's craters and the waterless seas get there? Well, um, I'm rather a rebel. Uh, I believe, frankly, that they're due to some kind of internal action. You can call it volcanic if you like. But I think this is a minority view, and most people prefer to believe that they were due to the impacts on the moon of huge pieces of matter, meteorites, in fact. 
the final preparations for a manned landing when the module was taken down to within 10 miles of the moon's surface and the pictures sent back were absolutely amazing. And all this led on to July the 16th, 1969, when Apollo 11 was launched from Cape Kennedy. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. What a roar! A great flame over twice the length. These were the final moments as Armstrong and Aldrin came down toward the Sea of Tranquility, ready for the first lunar landing. 30 seconds. Contact right. Okay, engine stop. The first man to step out onto the moon's surface was Neil Armstrong. And here you can see the huge shadow of the module. And here's the module standing on the moon's surface, where it stayed for a total of 22 hours. And here's the shot of the year, or any year. Taken by Neil Armstrong, it shows Colonel Edwin Aldrin on the moon's surface, and it sums up the achievement of Apollo 11. And then we must come to the two inner planets, Venus and Mercury. And uh, we knew so little about Venus, the planet of mystery. And there's one faint shading there, which is diffuse and not very prominent. That was all I could see. And quite frankly, that wasn't my fault, because on Venus, there's very little that you can see. But, of course, rockets have now been there, and earlier on this year, two Russian ones, Venera 5 and 6, actually parachuted down through Venus's atmosphere and landed on the planet, sending back signals as they did so. Let's begin with the very first one, the picture of the surface of Venus from Venera 9. And, uh, frankly, when I first saw that, I just couldn't credit it. There at the bottom, that um, semicircular thing is part of the spacecraft, and the rocks are very clearly displayed all around it. That there was so much uncertainty about what they would find, they even carried a detector for liquid water. Well, I must say, I think, so far as Mercury was concerned, we were fairly right about Mercury. This is Mercury, the region near the crater Handel. And here are some lunar uplands, which I photographed myself the other day. And you can see the general resemblance. Yeah, we had the moonlight object. We looked at Mars. Those yes. first Mars missions, Mars looked awfully like the moon because our images were so poor and everything looked a bit sort of dead. I was, I'm an atmospheric scientist in my original training. I went to the States and they said, you don't want to work on Mars. It's nothing of interest to atmospheric science. Go, go work elsewhere. Yet Mariner 9 turns up in the biggest dust storm we've ever seen. So let's have a quick look now at the very first pictures ever sent back from Mariner 9. And there's one showing a large area of Mars. And near the bottom, you can see a large dark patch. And that's been tentatively identified uh, with a feature that we know called Nix Olympica, although I think personally the identity is a bit nebulous. Not so long ago, most people believe there was vegetation upon Mars. Well, it's rather unlikely, I think, that any of our higher terrestrial plants would survive under Martian conditions, although it's just possible that some very lowly forms, which we've not yet tested, may. But just to show you the fate of higher plants, I've brought along tonight two cacti. This cactus has been quite healthily growing under earth conditions. And you see it's quite a nice, firm-looking sort of cactus. This one here has spent one night under Martian conditions. And I think you uh, can see without any doubt that it's got a distinctly morning-after appearance. Primitive life there may be. I don't even think so. Intelligent life, certainly not. So in other words, you rather think that Mars is a dead planet? Absolutely dead as a dodo. This, incidentally, is our only indication of possible life on Mars. Uh, you see in this picture there's a footprint, uh, yes. and this is an enlarged view. Uh, the inhabitants of Mars are, are large, if nothing else. Good evening. This is Mars. Incredible pictures sent back from Viking, showing a red, rock-strewn landscape under a pink sky. The detail is absolutely amazing, and these pictures would have seemed science fiction not so very many years ago. They're far out. Far beyond Mars, far beyond the asteroid belt, we come to uh, the giant planets. Again, we knew a bit about them, but not a great deal. Ron, um, let's begin our tour between the planets. Right, on this occasion then, I'll be Voyager 1. Now, I was launched from Earth in September 1977, and I was aimed at a point in the solar system where Jupiter will be in 1979. So in that intervening period, I've been moving off in this direction. I've been gradually feeling the immense gravitational attraction of Jupiter, and as I get closer and closer, I'm accelerated towards Jupiter, moving faster and faster, taking my measurements of this planet, swinging around it very close in, and in addition to the acceleration, I'm also 
also experiencing this deflection effect of the gravitational force, so that I'm being moved into a trajectory that carries me on towards Saturn. This was history, and it's, it's, it's history that, well, first they had great experience being there from the very beginning. Originally, we have a grand tour, wonderful, elaborate ma missions to explore these outer planets. We wanted to know how they were formed, what the satellites were like, and again, where they fit into the origin of the solar system. In fact, if we make a time-lapse sequence, we can first look, for example, Patrick, at the way Jupiter appeared during the Voyager 1 flyby of three months ago. What I would like to focus upon are the ways spots move in from the east and circle around the red spot. They take about six days to go around, and spots during Voyager 1, in fact, circle around for about ten rotations. Here's a rerun. This is still Voyager 1. Look at the red spot and note how it spins round. On the way to Jupiter, that's a, we're seeing Jupiter through the spacecraft. We're seeing these tiny little dots of the satellites. The geologists will ask, what do you expect? And the quote, and they won't mind me saying so, was that they expected you know, Io to be fully cratered and an extremely old surface, right the way out to Callisto, which is going to be thoroughly smooth. They were so wrong. Let's begin, Shelby Gary, with the Voyager 2 picture of the outermost of the Galileans, Callisto. And I think the important point is we're looking at a face patch we haven't seen before. This is the nice thing about having two flybys. We can see other aspects of the, these satellites. And again, it's totally cratered. There's not room to put any more craters down. Now, Voyager 1 is closing into Saturn, nearly 950 million miles away from the Earth. And even when still 50 million miles from Saturn, it began sending back spectacular pictures. Yes, even at this distance, Patrick, we can see the, the rings with the main division showing up and also, in fact, the evidence of Titan showing up in the picture as well. Here we go. Voyager coming into its closest approach of Saturn, the closest man had ever been. That's it. And here are the cheer from here in JPL. And Voyager has now passed its closest approach of Saturn. We've got the signals back and it's now started its never-ending journey between the stars. Got to say, more or less, the newest thing we've found, which was the discovery that the F-ring is not, uh, uh, not circular, it's eccentric. Not only is it eccentric, it looks like it's raving mad. So Voyager 2 is on its way, with Neptune far behind. Its story is not over. It should remain in touch for the next quarter of a century, by which time it will have reached the edge of that part of the galaxy where the sun's influence is dominant. After that, who knows? It could even end up in some alien museum. But of one thing I'm certain, Voyager 2, the most successful of all unmanned spacecraft, will never be forgotten. Well, since then, of course, um, one more mission we must mention here, because uh, one of the latest guidelines, Cassini to Saturn, and you were so deeply involved in that one, John. Indeed. I mean, do you remember that we talked about this, when was it, in, in the early 1990s on... on, on on yes. an earlier sky at mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of interest in the nature of the surface of Titan, particularly over the last 10 years since uh, Voyager gave us a lot of uh, information about Titan. The, the interest really stems from the fact that we really might be dealing with here a liquid-covered surface. And, of course, we, we, are, we arrived at, uh, at Saturn, what, just, just over a year ago? Yes. And uh, January the 14th of, of this year, Huygens landed at Titan. Well, I've actually just found out that uh, the probe has been on the surface for at least 45 minutes and is still transmitting. I think I can reveal now it's pretty close that we haven't splashed down. I'm not sure what we've hit, but it's something softish. We've got a, a, an impact deceleration of about 15 G. So it's that, that, that could be equivalent to, I'm not saying the surface is snow, but it's the sort of thing you'd get into semi, uh, deceleration you get in semi-compacted snow. It's fair to say we've learnt more about the solar system planets now than because it was impossible when we began the Sky at Night programme. What we've shared in 25, 30 years are the most extraordinary.